The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today's webinar, which is focused on business models and end-user perspectives. Um, so as a reminder, these webinars are designed for participants in the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge mainly, which is an initiative led by Efficiency for Access uh, with support um, of Engineers Without Borders UK. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, questions to our speakers, um, SNM Adolko and Sarah Johnson, throughout the webinar <laughs> in the GoToMeeting window that should be on the top right corner um, of your screen. Um, so you can ask questions by typing them throughout the um, webinar and we'll address them during the Q&A session at the end. Um, thank you for attending and I will now leave the floor to our, both our speakers. Great. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining. Uh, my name is Sarah and I'm here with Essinam as well. Um, to get started, I guess, first of all, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the organization where we work, which is called VBOX. Um, our mission is to transform lives and unlock potential through access to energy. Uh, and we do that through designing, manufacturing, distributing, uh, and financing solar home systems, as well as other products. So appliances, um, but then also we're looking at pay-as-you-go cooking uh, and a few other services as well. Uh, both Essinam and myself are product managers at VBOX, uh, so our job is really around designing and bringing to life uh, products uh, and then managing them through throughout their lifespan. Um, and that'll, uh, that, those two things will come into play uh, quite a bit as we, uh, as we walk you through the, the subject matter for today. Um, but first of all, we'll uh, both give a quick introduction to ourselves. Uh, Essinam, you want to go first? Um, so my name already mentioned, I'm SNM. Um, I studied to be an electrical engineer about seven years ago, um, but I found uh, that I liked the business end of, of engineering a bit more. So uh, I decided to become a product manager. Um, and actually, Beatbox is quite a good fit because my thesis was on um, how to uh, commercially make um, solar energy viable. So I guess I'm in the right place. Um, I've been with Vbox for 18 months now. Um, and it's really great to, to bring to you um, this webinar and, and to, to take your questions. Great, and my name's uh, Sarah Johnson. I am from the States originally, uh, and my degree is in economics from, from Stanford out in California. Um, but I've been in East Africa now for, uh, for about four years, working with a, a few companies out here. Um, I love being a product manager because I do sort of get to use my economics and, and business side, but also get to learn a lot about design uh, and sort of bring that, that side of my, my education into play as well. Great. Um, so the, the things we're going to talk to you about today, there's really three key questions that we're aiming to answer. Uh, number one, how can we incorporate the user into product design from, from day one? Number two, how can we make sure that the products that we are developing are actually commercially viable, that we can really sell them? Uh, and thirdly, how do we balance those two goals uh, that can sometimes be a, a bit contradictory uh, and make them both work as we develop a new product? Okay, so, so this is mostly my section, um, and we're going to kind of look a little bit into um, how to incorporate um, the user perspective in, in design. And from, from my perspective, I find that usually when, when as a designer you come across a problem, we, we take the problem from our perspective, um, and then we come up with a great idea, we design a solution, sometimes we test it, sometimes we don't. Um, and then and then we release it to the customer. And it's very easy. Um, can we go to the next slide? It's very easy to to forget that the most important person is the person who's actually going to use our product. Um, it's it's very important that at every point in this process, from when you identify the problem to when you finally give a, a solution to the customer, you actually keep in mind that there is somebody who's actually going to use this product. You have to keep their perspective in mind as well. And from, from what we know as a product designer, as a product manager, it's 
our job to be the voice of somebody who's not in the room. And most of the time, the customer is not in the room with us. So we have to make sure that we get their perspective at all times into the product design. Here, can we move to the next slide? So, like I said, it's very easy in that process to forget who the most important stakeholder is, and that's the person who's actually going to end up using that product. And you have to keep the user at the center of the product design for many reasons. The first is they are the main source of requirements for your product. You can't know what problem you're solving and how that problem impacts your um, user if you don't understand how they perceive that problem. So we use our, we go to our users to understand their perspective on the problem we have identified and to gather a requirement that we can translate into a technical requirement. So we want to be able at some point to say, as a user, I want this product to behave in this way because of this reason. That way, when the technical team is actually coming up with a product design, they can understand the reasoning behind um, the, the feature that they're designing and actually put that in perspective of the entire design. Another reason why you want to put the user as the center of your product design process is to refine your ideas. Usually we have a million and one ideas on how to solve a problem, but there is very few ideas that are actually feasible in the day-to-day -day life of, of our user. And it is only they who can tell you that this is the idea that best fits me. So you would have like your million and one and um, ideas and it will be good to involve your user so that you can actually take what works for them in the, in the context and then translate that into an idea. After that, you want to test. So most of the time, people would wait until they have a finished product to, to, test, um, to test the market. But ideally, we should be testing iteratively. We should be going to the users and saying, oh yeah, this is this is the solution we have. Does this fit what you, you asked for? Does it do what you think it should do? And after that, you can come back to um, to your your design um, your design base and say, okay, so the user like this, this and this, but they didn't like this, how can we improve? And that actually keeps you um, having fresh and innovative ideas all the time. That actually leads me into the next reason why we should have the user at the center of product design, and that is to get feedback and improve. Yes, you may have a product that works. Yes, you may have a product that fits the brief of what the user asked for, but sometimes it's a little tweak that may, takes us from being a niche product, for example, to something that is globally scalable. So it's good to get feedback from your customer, feedback on how you can uh, make the product better, and then you can continue to improve um, as you go along. So, Pio, next slide, please. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the different ways um, that you can involve users in um, product design. And I'll give you a few examples uh, from what Beepox has done. And then I'll actually take, after this, I'll take you through one specific example um, with, with a, a recent um, appliance development. So the first thing is to ask questions. Your users understand the, the problem the best. Um, you, can, you can never be exactly the person that is going to use your end product. So it's always great to find out about who is going to use your product. So you need to ask them how, what problem they're facing, how that problem impacts them. You need to understand the different variations of um, solutions that they have. Sorry, it seems we're having a technical issue. Um, okay. Yeah. 
I think that was me type of mistake. That's why. So I was, as I was saying, you you want to be in a position to ask the user as many questions as possible, especially about what alternatives they have to solving the problem, because you don't want to come out with a solution that doesn't make sense in terms of the alternatives. If you come up with a solution that is, for example, way too expensive um, to the alternatives they're using, and I, I will I will bring an example of. Um, uh, our TVs, for example, our, our customers who buy TVs obviously have no alternative to to have a TV. So this is this is why our TV solution works. Whereas if, for example, if we have customers who have an alternative for a TV, they would then begin to compare like the various features. So you need to find out. Okay, so if people don't have a TV, what else can they use? Can they use a radio? Can they use a tablet? And if they do have those options, and those options are a lot less feasible than yours, then you already have a, a very clear problem. Another thing, um, I think the second thing is to observe your user in their what I call their natural habitats. If um, and I'll take an example of our lights, um, light switches and light bulbs. At, um, that we designed, our users usually like to have a light on at the, um, throughout the night outside the house. It makes no sense to, to design um, a light that cannot be strung from our box to the outside of the house. We only found this out after we had actually observed what, um, how our users were using some of our light bulbs. So immediately as soon as you understand that then you can start to make changes to the way that the, the light box the light bulb connects to the box and actually think about where they switch this on where will they switch it off um how can how can we improve that experience so that users can find um satisfaction in the way that they use the product Another thing that is very easy to do, um, and I will talk a little bit about this um, in the next slide, is putting a product in your hand. So in, in my book, you need to prototype as quickly and as fast as possible. Put a product in the customer's hands and ask them, have them give you feedback, how, and find out how they're using it. Is, um, is the product working the way they expect? Do they want different things? Um, do, do they think that it doesn't fit exactly the need that they have? Sometimes we have an idea that doesn't necessarily work um, the way that a customer expects. So um, one, of, one of the things we realized, for example, with our fridge was that customers wanted to clean the fridge after they, they had it. And there was no way to actually have an off button in the fridge. So customers kept asking, why can't I put an off button in the fridge? And that's immediate feedback for us as designers to, to go back and say, okay, so where, where can we put an off button? How does an off button fit in with this design? Linking very closely with that is point four, which is to close your feedback loop. A lot of the time as designers, we will send out a product and yes, and so long as the product is in life, we really don't think about this. We make sure that it hits the numbers that it's supposed to hit, and we are fine. We are getting new sign-ups. Everything is all right. At least that's what we think. But we don't ever ask for our users' feedback. And I think that is very clear. That is very important if, if we want to improve the product. So um, another example with our TV is one of the things we realized was customers were complaining that, actually, your TV is not quite loud. So that is immediate feedback for us that how can we then improve the loudness of our TV? And if we can't improve the loudness of our TV, what else can we do to help our customers to have a, a better TV viewing experience? And actually, that led us into the development of our um, speaker. So basically, if you close your feedback loop, you get more innovative ideas. You get new ways to think about the same problem. And you get new I am um, you can consider new um, solutions to the exact same problem. Um, the last thing is to learn from the data. One thing that is not always apparent to designers is that customers don't always know what they want. So sometimes a customer will say one thing and then they will do something else. So um, customers will tell us we want a, a much la larger TV because we watch TV all the time. But sometimes all the time is not 
quantifiable. So you need to go back to the data and say, okay, so we can see that customers are watching TV six hours of the day instead of um, 12 that they told us. That is important information that you can put into your design and help um, to improve your design. So all of that actually comes from a position of being able to prototype as quickly as possible and getting that feedback from multiple sources. So you have quantitative data and then you have qualitative data. Right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, um, example with the iron and how we took it from all the through all the five steps. The first being um, listening to our customer and observing them. The second being giving them a prototype to, to test with and then actually improving the prototype based on feedback and on data. So in one of our markets in DRC, our number one requested appliance every time we spoke to customers was we want an iron. We need to be able to use irons with your system. So everybody kept on asking, how can we get an iron? So we found that it was very important to our customers that they, they have um, a way to iron their clothes. Then we started our research process. We, we spoke to people who were going to be paying customers of an iron and asked them, what are your alternatives today? Um, a lot of them said, well, we use a charcoal iron. And immediately we had their baseline. Okay, so that means our iron definitely has to be better than a charcoal iron, even if it can be as good as an AC iron. And so we went back with some requirements to our technical team, and then they made a first prototype, which we tested um, in our uh, labs and checked off that it met the basic needs of our customers. Then we send this iron back into the field and ask customers, what do you think? We got a lot of feedback just from even observing customers as they did their ironing. And we went back and actually redid the prototype and sent it back again for, for another round of testing. This is, at this point, it's in the stage B where we have a second prototype and we are asking customers, does this then meet your, your criteria for an iron? Is it hot enough? Does it, make you, does it allow you to iron as quickly as you can? All of this is information that we're going to add into the final design of our, of our iron. Basically, this is not a finished product. We're just going to, going to continue to um, iterate this iron until we have a product that is viable and can be sold. And that that is is a product that the customers would definitely be behind because we co-created that product with them. Um, here, next slide, please. So I just want to say that, like, in summary, we really want to co-create our products with our customers because in the end, we create a product that is fit for, for purpose. We create a product that customers, that meets the customer's need as they experience it. Another reason is, and, and actually links into what Sarah is going to talk about, is we know how viable the product is going to be. We understand how many people are going to buy it because we've kind of we've spoken to people and we understand where that need fits um, in their lives. Additionally, we have we get new ideas for products. Like I said, what we speak to our customers all the time and we get a request for a lot of appliances for for certain features to be added. And that's the only way that we can improve our products in a way that makes sense for our customers. And the fa final thing is we get innovative solutions to problems. So sometimes it's not as easy as just um, increasing the volume on your TV. Sometimes a customer will say, okay, I don't mind. I don't mind if you, if you don't increase the volume, but if you got me a speaker, then I have multiple uses for it. And that will also lead into um, the development of new appliances and new new features and new products. Um, Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you now. Great, thanks, I think. Um, so I'm going to sort of build on on what Essinam has talked about uh, and speak about how once we've designed a product for the customer, we can make sure that that product is actually commercially viable. So looking at the next slide. 
there's a, a few things uh, that we need to consider uh, when we think about commercial viability. Uh, first of all, we have to think about the entire life cycle of the product. Can this product actually be produced? Can it be delivered? Can it be serviced or repaired? Uh, does the total cost of the product align with what our actual target price point is? Uh, customers, uh, will they choose the product over all other alternatives, not just uh, direct competition? Uh, and lastly, are customers actually willing to, to pay for the product? And it's only once we consider all of these factors that we're able to, to figure out whether this is a product that we can actually produce and sell to customers uh, in a way that, that makes sense and will be scalable. So digging a little bit uh, on the next slide, digging a little bit into the, the first one of these. If we can just go to the, yeah. Um, <laughs> so the, the first question is, is sort of looking at the life cycle. Uh, when you consider a new product, um, once you consider what it's like in the customer's home, you have to also consider every other aspect of that product life. So you have to think about how is this product going to be produced? Is it gonna be produced locally? Is it gonna be produced in Europe? Is it gonna be produced in China? Uh, what is that actually gonna look like and who's gonna do it? How is it gonna be shipped? Is it feasible to ship this product? How will it be stored? How will it be delivered to the end customer? Uh, what will usage actually look like? Will you be able to repair the product? Uh, and lastly, even how are you going to dispose of this product? So if we take uh, a refrigerator as a, as a case study here, this is quite, uh, quite an interesting example. Um, this, the refrigerator is interesting for a few reasons. Firstly, uh, there's quite a few challenges around shipment and storage. Uh, there's, uh, there's a special sort of liquid refrigerant that needs to go into the refrigerator. Uh, which can make it actually quite hard to, to ship the product, uh, and it comes up against a lot of regulations. Uh, it's also a particularly hard one to deliver. For us, we deliver uh, a, lot of our, a lot of our products on the back of a motorcycle, and as you can probably imagine, not super easy to put a refrigerator on the back of a motorcycle. Um, so we have to think of some creative solutions to this. Uh, is there a way that we can design a refrigerator where it's very easy to remove the refrigerant and then add it again once it's arrived in its final destination? Uh, is there a way that we can make a refrigerator that actually comes apart into different pieces so that it can be flat packed and then put back together? Uh, in terms of repairs, if you're talking about uh, rural areas in a lot of the countries we work, no one's gonna have the skills to be able to repair a refrigerator. Um, what do we need to do to solve that? Is there a way we can design a product that's easily uh, fixable, that's easily repairable, uh, or that maybe just has a longer lifetime, so will need, need to be repaired as often, uh, things like that. So we have to consider all those steps as you actually uh, design the product. Uh, looking at the next slide, the second aspect of commercial viability has to do with total cost. So I think uh, as, you're, as you're working on your appliance design, I think there's there's a tendency to just think about uh, the cost of the product when it's produced and the amount the customer is willing to pay. But actually there's a lot more costs that go into actually getting that product from where it's produced into a customer's hands. And if you want a product to work from a financial perspective, you have to really think about all those costs. So some examples of those are financing. Uh, is the, that means is the product gonna be offered to the customer on a loan? Uh, and if so, what sort of interest will have to be paid on that? Um, delivery, how much does it actually cost to get the product from where it's produced to, to being with the customer? Are there taxes in the countries? Are there costs around customer service and how you provide service to, to the customer that buys this product? Are there costs around repairs, costs around sales? Do you need to pay a commission to a sales agent? Um, if, unfortunately, it is sold on a loan, there's always a risk that you'll have to repossess that product. That's going to cost money. Uh, and finally, the actual solar home system that, uh, that the appliance is sold with, or in some cases, at least just the panel and battery, um, you have to think about that cost. So taking uh, again, the iron as the, the case study here, um, we sell all of our appliances on, uh, on loans. So that means we have to borrow money from somebody else uh, and then use that to then offer, uh, offer the product on a loan to our customer so that it's more affordable to them and they can pay in installments. We have to think about the cost of that loan uh, and thinking about that total product cost. We also have to think about delivery. Uh, as I mentioned, this often happens in the back of a, a motorcycle. So you have to, to factor in the cost of that person and also of the motorcycle itself. 
Uh, we have a customer service center, uh, so we need to think about, okay, if somebody has a problem with the iron or with the solar home system, how are they going to get help? Do we have the infrastructure to, to help them uh, and to repair it? Uh, and then finally, the solar home system itself. Uh, iron's are particularly important for this because an iron uses quite a bit of energy. Uh, so there's always a balance between the cost of the iron and the cost of the solar home system. If you're thinking about, okay, maybe we can make a more efficient iron and then the cost of the iron is gonna go up, but the cost of our solar home system is gonna go down. Or alternatively, make it, maybe it makes more sense to increase the, uh, sorry, decrease the efficiency of the iron, pay more for the, uh, or pay less for the iron, uh, and then pay more for the actual solar home system. Uh, so you have to be thinking about total cost in terms of total system cost as well, uh, and how you can make that affordable. Looking at the next slide, um, our customer is going to buy this product. That's pretty crucial, right? It's one thing for, for a customer to, to say that they, they will get it uh, and that they like the idea of a product. Uh, it's a very different thing for them to actually choose that product uh, against all the other alternatives that they could use to meet that need. Um, so competition doesn't just include exact, uh, exact competitor products, but also locally available products that then people might buy in a local market, uh, maybe renting. Uh, so for example, with phone charging, they don't necessarily need to buy a phone charger. They could, they could pay per use in phone charging, um, as well as, of course, products from, from direct competitors. So if we take the shaver for, for an example here, uh, when we think about the shaver and the competition there, you have to first start with a question, what do people actually use the shaver for? In our case, it's not actually to shave themselves. It's usually to, to run a small business. So people buy a shaver uh, and then they pay, you know, pay uh, 20 cents or 30 cents, or they collect 20 or 30 cents from customers uh, who then pay them to, to shave their heads. So the opportunity here from a customer's perspective is this is a tool that I can use uh, to run a small business. So when we have to think about will customers buy this product, it's what are their other opportunities to, uh, to start a small business? What are the other products they could buy to start a small business? Uh, and all of those products are actually our competition. So we have to think about, okay, they could start a phone charging business. How much would that cost? How much revenue would they get from that? They could start a small chapati shop, a small bread shop. How much would that cost? How much would they make from that? Uh, and in sort of thinking, thinking about competition, we have to think about that in, a, in that very broad sense uh, if we actually want to understand whether our customers will buy this. Uh, next, sort of along the same line, uh, we have to think about not only is this a good option for customers, but will they actually buy it? So customers are, are notorious. Uh, it's, it's sort of a it's very, very common for people to say that they're going to buy something uh, and then for there to be a pretty big gap uh, between what people say and what they actually do. So it's really important in, in considering as you design an appliance to, to look really closely at whether people are willing to actually uh, put up money to, to buy a product. Uh, so there's a few different ways you can do this. Uh, the, the best case uh, is that you're actually able to do a randomized sale trial. So actually try selling the product at various price points uh, and look at how, how many people are willing to buy at each price point. Uh, that's the ideal version, right? Because then you really get a, a good picture of, okay, we sell it at this price, this many people will buy, this price, this many people will buy, and you can map out a really clear demand curve. Uh, but in the reality of product development, that's often not the case. Uh, so there are some other alternatives. Uh, one, you can try selling a product that's similar um, and that can be either either at large scale or small scale. Uh, if you're doing customer research, you can even carry with you a product that is similar to what you're developing uh, and actually try to sell that during your customer visits. Pretend that it's a real product, see what people say. That'll already give you a little bit of a sense beyond just sort of a, a general commitment to buy. Are people actually willing to buy today? Uh, you can also look at sales of similar products. So try to find uh, uh, someone who's selling something that's similar and look at their sales trends, compare their prices to your prices, compare their features to your features and, and see how much they're actually able to sell. That'll give you a, a good baseline. Uh, and then lastly, you can do surveys. So you can actually just go out and you know, call 100 people and ask them if they will buy something. Um, but when doing that, keep in mind 
uh, that probably quite a few less people will actually buy than say they do. Uh, in the willingness to pay surveys we do, we usually use uh, about 25 to 30 percent of people that say they will buy something actually will buy it. So it is rel a relatively small amount, um, but that's still a good, it'll still give you a good sense uh, generally of whether there's interest in the product and whether people are actually willing to, uh, to pay for that product. Yeah, I think that, that's uh, about it. So we've spoken today about, uh, SE spoke first about uh, how we can design products for, uh, for customers uh, and with the user really uh, at the center of their mind. Uh, and then I spoke a little bit about once we've thought about the user, how can we think about, uh, uh, about all the other users and really make sure that the product is viable from a commercial perspective. Thanks to both of you uh, for this very insightful uh, presentation. Um, so before we move to questions, I want to remind our attendees that you can ask questions um, clicking on the question button, I assume, in the go to webinar window on the top right of your screen. So please do ask questions to our panelists um, that are available for an extra half an hour now. Um, so thank you. And as you say, Tara, you so Essie talked about um, um, user experience and how to define um, user needs exactly. And you talked more about the commercial viability of products. Um, the first question, um, and I think you, you'll have a lot to say about it, uh, both of you, um, is how do you balance these two things? So how do you balance user experience and commercial viability? Um, which one is more important um, and how do you decide which one is more important depending on the product? Yeah, definitely. Um, I can I can answer first maybe uh, and then uh, and then SNM, uh, you can can also add I'm sure you have a lot of separate thoughts as well. Um, from from my perspective, I think I mean it's a bit of a cop out, but I think they are both sort of very crucial, right? Uh, if you don't design something that uh, that meets the user's needs, no one's going to buy it. If it's not commercially viable, you're not going to be able to make it and sell it. Um, so I think they're both sort of equally important. And if you're missing either one of those, you're uh, you're really going to, to have some challenges. Uh, I think one way to sort of uh, incorporate both of them into the design is to actually think about some of the aspects of commercial viability as user design as well. So if we if the you know question number one is this product needs to be able to be produced then treat the people that are producing that product as users as well. Go to the production facilities, think or figure out where it's going to be produced uh, and, and really understand the needs of those people. Or if the need is that it's going needs to be repaired, um, again, the people in, in repair centers or, or the people that are in charge of that side of things are also users um, and you need to understand their requirements uh, just as well. Um, so I think especially for that life cycle side of, of commercial viability, uh, sort of thinking about your, your user base in a broader sense uh, can really help to, to sort of mesh those two things and, and make sure they're both, both accounted for. Yeah, so another thing I think that is helpful in trying to merge these two, and that's something that we do quite well at Bbox, is we ask ourselves how much is a user willing, for example, to pay for this product? And then we try to add that as a requirement for the product. So then basically we start from a point of, okay, so we hope to, uh, we aim to make this product at this price point um, and, and at that price point we'll still make some money, um, but then it actually meets the user need. And then we take that requirement to, to the um, technical team and say, okay, so whatever we design has to meet um, these requirements, including the commercial requirements. And that actually helps kind of harmonize those two um, in a way that is that allows the product to be both user-friendly and commercially viable. Great, thanks. Um, and and uh, following uh, the question, do you have examples um, from B-Box or from the industry overall of um, products that did where, where designers didn't really find that balance between user experience and commercial viability? So our first version of our shaver uh, is actually an example of that. Uh, so the, the one that I showed a picture of today is, is sort of our most recent version. 
Um, but the first time, uh, the first time we designed a shaver, uh, we anticipated that it would be used mostly for home use. Uh, and in order to, and so we we sort of went for we went for a shaver that was relatively low cost, um, so that we could sell it at a price point that uh, that people were willing to pay, uh, and that was one that was good enough quality to be used once or twice per day, but not ten or fifteen times per day uh, as as people want to for commercial uses. Um, and so as we started selling it, we started getting lots of complaints uh, and we started getting lots of failures. And we had to sort of revisit it and say, okay, why is this happening? Why is it not meeting the needs in the way we thought it was going to? Uh, and it was because people were trying to use it for that commercial use. So we had to go back, restart our customer research uh, and put together a new set of requirements and say, okay, if people are gonna uh, use this for a commercial use, we actually need six hours of battery life per day. Uh, we need this product to be able to last for 2000 shades um we need it not to we need it to be able to be used you know three times in a row instead of just one time um and so we had to actually go back and, and revisit all those requirements and and really work a, a lot harder on our design uh to still keep it at that price point um but be able to meet the the real use case great thanks uh, good example indeed um, <clears throat> this question was, well, Essie, you, you touched base on it, but uh, you can both answer, right? Um, could you tell us a bit more about how you do and how you conduct your, your consumer research in practice? Um, as in, like, are you going to people asking questions? Do you give them the products and look at them and look at their behavior? Could you tell us a bit more about that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to I'll, I'll start and I'm sure Sarah has a lot of um, stuff to add to this as well. So one part of being a product manager in Dbox, for example, is spending a lot of time with customers. Um, that means um, do, conducting customer visits uh, to see how um, they use the product, um, asking them questions. And like I said, a little bit about actually looking at the data that comes from the use of your product. So those are three things that we do quite well in Vbox. And just an additional thing that we do in, um, is to rely heavily on our market research team. So they spend quite a lot of time with our customers and with competition customers to understand the needs of the market and allow us to and give us that information which allows us to also continue to innovate and improve our, our products. Yeah. yeah, definitely. I mean, I think I think Essie is very right that, that spending time with the, the customers is the most important thing. Uh, and I think during those those times, always having having new products and, and new things to, to test out. Uh, so, well, whenever we're considering a new product, the first thing we'll do is buy as many samples as we can of similar products and start showing those to customers. Um, so I think it's, it's easy to say, OK, no, this isn't exactly what we want to produce, so we're not going to show it to customers yet. Um, but then you don't learn. So it's much better to, as soon as you have anything in your hands that's remotely similar to what you're trying to produce, take it to a customer. So for example, if we're considering tablets, um, we'll go out and buy a, a bunch of local tablets from the local market uh, and bring it to customers and start getting feedback on day one, uh, instead of just asking them questions about, uh, about what they want to, uh, what they would want to buy and then designing something and, and, and showing it to them. Well, thanks uh, for the answers. Um, moving forward, uh, we have another question. Um, so you're probably aware of the sustainable uh, development goal of leaving no one behind, and that is a very broad uh, statement to make. Uh, so talking about gender inclusion, also children, um, disabilities, etc. Um, how does B-Box, um, take that into account when designing a product and how is it uh, something uh, you incorporate in, in the process of designing a product? Yeah, definitely. So I, I think uh, it is always a challenge, right? Especially when you're trying to be, uh, to be a commercial company. Uh, I think it would be dishonest to say that's not a challenge. Uh, there's always a balance between, uh, between designing something that really can access as many customers as possible uh, and designing something that uh, that can be sort of commercially sold. 
Um, but a lot of that is uh, a lot of the, the way to get over that is to really have sort of a consistent focus on both affordability and quality uh, and trying to find the, the balance there uh, and constantly trying to, to, to get costs down uh, without that, uh, sorry, without, uh, without uh, sacrificing uh, quality and then sort of the, the, the quality of the products that you're producing. Um, but I think there's another aspect just around considering all different kinds of users. So we often distinguish uh, in, in our work between the user and the payer. Uh, in a lot of the markets where we work, uh, the reality is that it's often the, the male who's the head of household who controls the finances, um, but it's often the women and the children who are actually using the product. Um, so if you go into a, a customer visit, uh, it's sort of natural often for it to be the, the man who answers most of the questions. Um, but it's important to, to not just uh, listen to his requirements, but also speak to the people that are actually using the product, uh, which is often other people. Uh, the iron, which we talked about a lot, is a good example of that. Um, you've got several different layers of users there, right? It's often often the man who's, who's paying for it, um, but it's either the women uh, or sometimes even the children or other people who work in the household uh, who are actually the ones using the product. Um, so you have to get all of those perspectives um, if you're really going to, to design a product that's going to, to do the best job for the people using it. Thank you. Um, Essie, do you want to say something about it, maybe? Actually, I don't have much to add to that. It's really um, about finding out um, who's going to end up actually using the product and understanding their perspective and their needs um, and trying to align all of those that the user, the payer and um, the, obviously the commercial need and trying to make sure that there's some alignment. I can't say it's an easy task, but it is a task that we, we normally have to undertake. One, sorry, adding one more thing, I guess one, one, uh, one benefit of something like the, the solar industry is that often because it's women and, uh, and children who are using the products, uh, if we do end up saving them time, um, then it does open up a lot of their time for, for other activities. Uh, yeah. So sort of to, to that sustainable development goal, um, I think there's some significant benefits that aren't always obvious uh, in terms of, you know, if you can, uh, if women have to spend less time walking to the market to buy candles, or if children are able to study with light, or, or sort of all these other things, uh, they can have a, have a pretty significant impact there. Nice, thanks. Um, and I'm using the opportunity to flag to our attendees that uh, our next webinar um, held for the Efficiency for Access Design Challenge will be actually focused on uh, social inclusion and in particular uh, gender and disability. Um, thank you. I have um, a last question for you too. Um, so obviously B-Box um, is spread across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and you mentioned, for example, that the iron is designed for the DRC market. Um, could you tell us uh, more about potential differences there are between countries and how one product adapted for one market could not be for another one? Do so you want to go first on this one? Okay, so um, I, I started laughing when you when you started the question because we find this very very um, keenly in, um, for example, the DRC versus, for example, Rwanda, where we have in DRC a more peri-urban um, and a more wealthy customer as compared to um, Rwanda, where we have most of our customers being um, rural farmers. So usually, um, what we do is we do spend time across both uh, markets, across multiple markets, trying to understand the various um, use cases for the same um, product. With that in mind, then we come back and actually align across, okay, so what is, what is equal in, in both places? What um, use cases actually um, exist in both scenarios? And then we can actually begin to distill some requirements from there. If we find, for example, that there's a product that is very specific to a market, then we, we actually then kind of stay in that market and design on a smaller scale, co-creating with the market. So um, very much, for example, the iron is very much co-created with the, the DRC markets because it is um, a major plan for them, but doesn't necessarily translate into um, 
uh, viability in, in other markets. Sarah? I, I very much agree with that. I mean, I think it, it does come down to, to just sort of putting in the time uh, and, and making sure not to, to assume uh, that users are the same across markets and to really visit them, treat each new market as a, as a new product launch uh, and a new product development, essentially. Um, and there are there have been occasionally times for us where we have had to uh, design appliances slightly differently for different markets. Uh, and certainly in terms of the actual solar home systems themselves, uh, we do have uh, each different market has to have a different combination of, of systems to sort of meet the, the needs there. You know, some of our West African markets, it's essential that they have a, a fan and a TV together. So we're looking at, at that use case uh, versus someplace like Rwanda. Uh, they're not really interested in the fan. It's not as hot. Um, so our goal is really just to meet their basic needs at as an affordable a price as possible. Um, so there is some sort of redesign that, that has to happen for different markets, certainly. Thank you. Um, I run out of question, <laughs> and I think yeah. uh, we, we're done now uh, with the audience, which is great. Um, so I want to thank you. Do, do you want maybe to, to have a final word uh, before we conclude? To the students participating in particular? I mean, from my side, um... Great to be on here. Um, I hope everybody uh, has, has a great time with their projects. Um, I was saying to, to the host earlier that I actually initially got involved in, in this sector and in this region uh, through a class project uh, a bit similar to what you're doing. Um, so I think it is really a great opportunity to, to learn and, and to get some hands-on experience. Um, so, so best of luck in that and I hope you have a, have a great time. Yeah, same here. Just all the best while you, you work on, on your projects and um, just keep the customer in mind um, and, and the end user and also remember that it has to make financial sense as well. Great. Thank you very much. And thanks to both of you. It was a very interesting presentation. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll, we'll meet you all again uh, for our social inclusion um, webinar in, in December, date to be announced soon. Um, and yeah, and you, you'll get an evaluation form at the end of this webinar. Uh, please take five minutes to, to fill it out. Um, thank you to all our attendees and thank you, Essie and Sarah, for, for your presentation today. Very welcome, Bye-bye. Bye-bye.